Okay, so uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, work that I started during my PhD, in, which I'm now continuing uh, as a postdoc. So I did my PhD in uh, McGill, and now I'm in Newlish, um, virtually at least. Um, so my work is uh, about creating uh, receptor atlases um, at ultra high resolution in 3D. Um, and the reason why we would want to do this, I mean, it's pretty obvious. We want to be able to characterize normal and pathologic receptor distributions. Um, and this is obviously important because sort of this is the chemo architecture that underpins information processing in the brain. Um, there are two primary modalities that we can use for receptor mapping. One is autoradiography, which um, has the advantage of being very high resolution, um, about 50 microns in plane. Um, and it, uh, you can use more ligands to measure different uh, receptor densities than with PET. Um, but it has important downsides as well, such as it's very expensive. It only produces 2D images, and of course, it can only be acquired post-mortem. Um, by contrast, uh, PET has two important advantages, namely that it's in vivo, so you can characterize receptor distributions throughout uh, the normal lifespan. And um, it's also relatively inexpensive, uh, at least compared to autoradiography. Um, and so this means that this is really the modality that we're going to need to use probably if we want to create uh, large scale data sets uh, from uh, potentially hundreds of people. Uh, but it has the important limitation that we don't really know what is the maximum resolution of PET. Uh, but there's been really great work out of uh, Gita Knudsen's lab uh, in Copenhagen, um, and they've already published uh, several serotonin atlases and uh, a uh, GABA-A receptor atlas with PET. Um, so I'm first going to talk, uh, I'm going to do a, a recap for those uh, who, who maybe are not familiar with my work yet, uh, who haven't heard my past talks on this last time we met. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing now uh, to move forward with the 3D reconstruction of the 2D autoradiographs. Um, so the data that I'm going to be talking about comes from three postmortem human brains. Uh, each are uh, visualized for 20 different receptor binding sites using in vitro receptor autoradiography. And they're acquired sequentially. So this is very important because what that means is, let's say your first section is for benzodiazepine. You have to go then another 20 sections before you go back to at least another 20 sections before you get back to uh, another benzodiazepine uh, uh, section. So that means that there's at least a 400 micron gap between any particular receptor type. Um, and of course, this data were collected by Carl Zillis and uh, Nicola Palomero Gallagher. Uh, so the data looks like this, for those who have not seen it before. And it covers uh, several different uh, neurotransmitter receptor families. Um, so including glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine. Um, now, there are lots of challenges that had to be addressed in order to reconstruct these 2D autoradiographs. Um, one is just obviously the fact that the different receptor densities have very different levels of intensity between types of receptors. Uh, the brains had to be acquired fresh. There's a lot of morphological deformation in the brains. Uh, the brains were cut into slabs, which are not perfectly parallel to one another. Um, there's lots of missing or incomplete sections. And there's a lot of variability in sort of how the autoradiographs were acquired in terms of sort of like visual artifacts that were placed on the images. Uh, so I came up with a series of steps to address these, the first of which would be to pre-process the images to sort of isolate the target piece of tissue from the autoradiograph. Um, and this involved training a unit to do line detection and then using some standard computer vision techniques to isolate the target piece of tissue from the uh, image. The next step is to align the autoradiographs to one another. So here we're aligning uh, each autoradiograph to its neighbor. So you could be aligning, for example, a GABA section to a glutamate section. Um, it's not just within a particular receptor type. But once you have this initial uh, reconstruction within a given slab, you can then align it to uh, the donor's MRI. Um, and then from there, uh, I implemented a technique to interpolate between uh, missing sections for a given receptor type. So let's say you want to create a volume that is just for dopamine or just for a serotonin receptor. Um, you have to find a way to sort of fill in the missing gaps between the particular serotonin uh, sections that you have. Um, and in this case, um, the, uh, what you see here, the lines in green are uh, sections where we have uh, uh, benzodiazepine receptor uh, autoradiographs. And then what you see in between is uh, what's been interpolated. 
then finally, we can map this back in onto the donor's brain. So you see that here for just slab one. Um, and then this is for all the slabs for the right hemisphere from one of the donors. Um, and then here you see a GIF showing the reconstruction for uh, four different uh, benzodiazepine receptors. So just to show that it works for multiple receptors uh, so far. Um, but I haven't applied it to all the receptors yet, uh, in part just for uh, computational server space reasons, but also because there are some receptors with very low contrast where the techniques I've developed so far uh, may not work yet. Um, I, you also probably noticed that there were gaps between the slabs. So I started doing work on um, interpolating between these gaps. And so this, what you see here, is using a sort of a simple volumetric interpolation technique. Um, I won't really go into the details of it because there's a lot of problems with it. It was just sort of like a, a proof of principle to see if I could actually do it at all. Um, and a lot of the problems that uh, are inherent in using a volumetric approach can be solved by going to a surface-based interslab interpolation method. So the idea is that if you uh, have all of your slabs uh, projected onto the surface, then you can calculate, um, you can interpolate between values uh, within a slab just along the surface. And that way you preserve sort of the laminar distribution of the receptors more so than with uh, the volumetric approach. Um, so this has not been uh, fully implemented yet. This is uh, something I'm still working on. Um, but uh, sort of the way you would go about doing this is here, what it, you see is the distances for uh, inter-slab vertices. Uh, so the distance from that vertex to the uh, nearest slab. And so you can sort of use this information to then um, do a, a, a guesstimate of what kind of uh, receptor density you should expect at a particular uh, vertex location between slabs. Um, some other work that I've been doing is, is less uh, technically sophisticated, but um, the work I've presented so far was just for one hemisphere from one brain, but we have in fact a lot more data. Um, and so using semi-automated and just manual techniques, I've gone through the 18,000 uh, autoradiographs that we have and uh, cropped them so that we can now uh, Re reconstruct all three brains uh, with all three with all with both hemispheres. Um, another thing that uh, Conrad and I uh, have been working on, uh, this is from when Conrad came to visit in, in Montreal this winter, um, is coming up with a better way of doing gray matter segmentation for histological and uh, audio radiographic sections. Um, and so our hope is that we can do sort of like a one size fits all network that will uh, segment the cortex regardless of modality, more or less. Um, so it's very ambitious and it sounds kind of crazy, uh, but we had some initial uh, good results with that, which I think are promising. Um, the essential tricky thing is that if you just let a unit do the segmentation, it has a tendency to find a very simple solution, which is just doing sort of like intensity thresholding and not actually learning uh, the shapes of the cortex. And so that doesn't generalize well. In order to force the unit to generalize a bit better, uh, we basically made the problem harder by forcing not the unit not only to learn the cortical segmentation, but also distance maps from the cortex, as well as learning the cortical border. So what you see here is if this is our source in the left-hand side and what we're trying to learn is this, um, then the network has to uh, learn the uh, segmentation, the distance map from the, from the cortex and the border itself. And um, we had some initial promising results. So we're gonna keep working on that. And this should, this is really important. The reason I'm stressing this is because it's very important for uh, improving the overall reconstruction because a large portion of the reconstruction depends on having a good uh, cortical segmentation of the receptor data. Um, so there's a lot of future perspectives for this work. I'm not gonna go too much in detail because there's one more application I'd like to talk about. Um, but so obviously we can look at gradients of, uh, of receptor distribution, gene expression, uh, do 3D fingerprint analysis, as well as use this data for computational modeling of sort of how neuronal information is propagated through the brain. Uh, one particular application that is of interest to me, as I mentioned before, we can also use PET for receptor mapping. And I think that that's something that uh, has to be, uh, that shouldn't be forgotten, even though it has sort of lower resolution. 
And so we can use this receptor reconstruction to do realistic PET simulation. Um, I'll skip over a few slides so that I have time to talk about everything. But so what I did was use um, the 3D reconstruction of the benzodiazepine atlas. And I sort of put that into a 3D PET simulator uh, called GATE. And this simulator sort of performs a digital PET scan that takes into account most of the physics involved in actual PET acquisition. Um, and so what you can see then is on the left-hand side, we have the original a section from the original receptor volume. And then on the right-hand side, we have sort of the mm, theoretical maximum resolution we could get uh, from PET that is produced by the PET simulator. Um, and so then we can compare these to see how accurately the PET image reflects the underlying receptor distribution. Um, and one way to do that is just to calculate the local cross-correlation within a sliding window between the two images. Um, and if you do that, what you get is this, and the overall sort of like correlation is 0.71. So it shows that PET is actually able to capture uh, a, a fairly high degree, in theory, PET is able to capture a fairly high degree of similarity between the uh, ground truth receptor distribution and the uh, simulated PET image. Um, and so I think this is an interesting future uh, branch of work. Um, in part because uh, there's a lot of uh, higher resolution scanners that are coming, uh, that are being developed, which can go to maybe about like 1.2 uh, millimeter resolution. So with some uh, resolution enhancement algorithms, maybe it could go a little bit below. And so then you're really talking about fairly high resolution PET. And so if we can map this data into the big brain, then um, we can not only have receptor data from autoradiography, which obviously has the higher resolution, but we can also complement that with uh, receptor data that comes from um, a wider variety of subjects throughout uh, lifespans and looking at particular uh, diseases or disease states or things like that. Um, so with that, I will uh, conclude. Oh, so yeah, we have a receptor pipeline that can, uh, in principle, reconstruct uh, three the three brains, both hemispheres for all 20 receptors. Um, and uh, using realistic PET simulation, we can sort of get an assessment of how accurate PET is and therefore uh, sort of what is the maximum resolution we could hope to get with it and how we could then, uh, what spatial scale we could take from PET and incorporate that, that into a broader uh, receptor atlas. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, my PhD supervisors and the people from the MNI, uh, Eulish and uh, UCL who have uh, collaborated and uh, yes, thank you very much to the funding sources. And with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Thomas, for this wonderful talk. Um, any questions? I just learned how to, how to see if, when people are raising hands. But I don't see any hands right now. Yeah, there is some. Tristan has a question. Uh, so Tristan, please go ahead. I gave you the stage today. You should be able to talk now. Just talk. Does not work. Um, are you connected now, this time? Yes, um, about, yeah, there you okay. are. Sorry for that. Um, just a, it's, it's a, just a quick thing, Thomas, and so, sorry if I, if I missed that. Great talk, by the way, but uh, can you give us an idea of the, um, of the volume of data that, uh, that's involved in your, in your work? In given um, rights or, you know? Yeah, so I guess it would be... Hmm. It's basically three big brains. Um, okay. However, that's because the sampling, uh, the pixel size for the autoradiographs raw is uh, 20 microns by 20 microns in plane, but the effective resolution is uh, uh, 50 microns. So you could downsample it to reduce it by uh, about a factor of two, uh, but it's comparable to about three big brains. Okay, thank you. Okay. This is second question, we can quickly take it. Uh, Farid again. Um, sure, thank you. Uh, thanks, Thomas. So I have two quick questions. One is, 
the ground truth method for receptor. Are there any technicalities that we should be aware of? For the we, simulation? Um, before we try to use them to quote unquote validate the pet measurements. Uh, and the other is that your work and a few of the other talks in this session are leading to the observation that about one millimeter or thereabouts resolution is what we can anticipate uh, in vivo with regard to anatomy. And uh, with a lot of advancements that we're making, especially at high field, um, even functional measurements, uh, metabolic measurements will coincide at one millimeter. Is that sufficient enough a resolution to do the type of segmentation that you're confident with? Uh, so for the first question, uh, for what uh, like things need to be taken into account to do realistic PET, um, there are other things that can influence the, because these are basically images of specific binding, but there can be also like non-specific binding, off-target binding, um, patient movement, um, things like that, some of which can be taken into account. We have non-specific binding images, for example, for the odd radiograph, so we could use that to sort of add noise in some sense. Uh, patient motion is something that could be incorporated into GATE. Um, so the, um, I think to, this is just to say that uh, I think you can have a, this is the most realistic way I can think of to do PET simulation. Um, I can't say that it will ever 100% replicate an actual living person uh, with blood flow and movement and things like that. Um, uh, so yeah, for the second question, um, I guess, I don't think I made any claims to what resolution you could segment at. Um, I guess my answer would just be, it, if one millimeter or thereabouts, maybe a bit lower within the case of MRI is the best data we can have, then I guess we sort of have to, and that's just the best we have. And we have to tailor the questions that we ask to the kind of data that we have.